In this episode of The Lore Lodge, we ask the archaeological community to show us where on the doll the scary Atlantis man hurt them. I'm Aiden Mattis, and welcome back to The Lore Lodge. Atlantis is a concept that most people, especially in the Western world, are pretty familiar with. Now, you might not have a serious, solid concept of it in your head, but you're gonna know the basics. There was a kingdom or a, an island, a continent, with a civilization on it that at some point in the distant past sank beneath the waves due to either their hubris or some sort of natural disaster. The concept under the name Atlantis was of course introduced to us by Plato way, 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 way back in the Greek classical period and has evolved throughout the ages to be the more recognizable version now. But for most of that time period, it's been thought of as simply an allegory, not something that actually ever existed, but rather something that the ancients used to teach lessons about hubris and pride and other factors of the human condition that could lead us into grave disaster. Disaster. But then, in the early modern and industrial era, we started to get a little bit more intense about Atlantis. People started to ask the question, well, what if this wasn't just a figment of our imaginations? What if this was a real thing that really did exist? What if this is a real event that happened in our history? Now, many of the early attempts at understanding what Atlantis could have been and where it could have been located were fraught with scientific implausibilities and a just vast lack of evidence. In reality, all this was was a collection of myths and legends that people were putting together in an attempt to form a coherent storyline. In the last 30 years, however, that's taken a pretty distinct turn, as a certain individual would say, things just keep getting older, and that individual is Graham Hancock. And speaking of coherent storylines, I'm sure you're all wondering how things are going with Bigfoot. Well, something occurred to me. A lot of my personal information is probably on the internet, and Bigfoot may come looking for it. I mean, have you ever been on Google and thought, you know what, I'll, I'll just look myself up, and then been shocked to find that a whole bunch of your personal information is just publicly listed on some site? I did some digging on myself and realized that past addresses of mine, phone numbers I may have had at some point, and of course my name were listed on some pretty disreputable looking places. As it turns out, data brokers are making a fortune selling your information. This goes out to robocallers, scammers, and telemarketers who want to know more about you, like your phone number, your email address, or even where you live. And that's why I'm excited to tell you about today's sponsor, Aura. Aura can identify data brokers who are exposing your info and fill out the opt-out requests that those organizations are legally required to respect. Unfortunately, many of these sites make that very difficult to do, but Aura can do it for you. The good news is you can try Aura for free for two whole weeks by using the link that is on screen and in the description. Aura also does so much more to protect you and your family from online threats that you may not even know about. It's really easy to set up, so you don't have to download a million in different apps to get all of the services you need. Aura comes with tools like parental controls, VPNs, password management, identity theft insurance, and more. You get all of that at one affordable price. And this is all very important to me because I need to make sure that a tribe of Sasquatch cannot find me. That's why I let Aura do the hard work of keeping me safe online so that I can just focus on other tasks and be at peace. You can either let people continue to exploit and profit off of your personal information, or you can go to aura.com slash lore and get your free trial. And the link is also in the description. And now back to the spooky Atlantis man. But who is Graham Hancock? If you ask the internet, then pretty much every article from 2022 onward is going to tell you that he is a horrible racist man with a bunch of horrible bad pseudo-archaeological ideas. But aside from being arguably the most hated man in archaeology, Graham is first and foremost a journalist and an author. Born August 2nd, 1950, the young Graham Hancock spent most of his time in India after being born in Edinburgh, Scotland. He returned to England to study at Durham University, where he got his degree in sociology and went on to work as a journalist for publications such as The Times, The Sunday Times, The Independent, and The Guardian. Now you will notice these are all fairly reputable newspapers. And from 1981 to 1983, he was the East Africa correspondent for Time magazine. And the first 15 years of his career were pretty cut and dry standard for a man of the English upper middle class in the journalist profession. But then in 1987, as he himself admits, he started to get very, very heavily interested in the practice of smoking weed. And not just not just a little bit. He says that for about 16 years, he was permanently stoned. 
At the time, he believed that this was helping his writing, but upon later reflection, according to a TED talk he gave in the 2000s, this began to, to wear on him. He started to realize that he was abusing this substance, and what brought him to that realization was, of course, using ayahuasca. That use of these various psychoactive drugs led him to believe that, you know what, maybe these theories, these suggestions, that humankind achieved a state of consciousness and sapience as we know it today was due to our use in prehistory history of certain psychedelic substances. Essentially, we reach this point in our cognitive development because we were using things like magic mushrooms. To be clear, this is currently just a theory, a hypothesis really. It is still being investigated. We don't totally know when we became what we are. But around the time he started using marijuana, he developed an interest in the ancient past. This included that use of psychedelics, the idea of a lost great advanced civilization, the Ark of the Covenant, and then even the idea of some sort of advanced or extraordinary race of beings, be they human or something else, helping us to jumpstart civilization. He achieved a form of stardom in the 1990s when he published two books, The Sign and the Seal and Fingerprints of the Gods. The former book focuses on the Ark of the Covenant, while the latter, Fingerprints, is more about the idea of an ancient advanced civilization that was present in Antarctica at a time when Antarctica was not at the South Pole. And if you're uh, familiar with our channel and you've seen our video on the Adam and Eve story, yes, Graham Hancock was talking about crustal displacement theory. Now, obviously, we know that crustal displacement theory is nonsense, but at the time, it seems he, he was not aware of that. And he is pretty directly invoking guys like Charles Hapgood and Chan Thomas who of course wrote about crustal displacement theory in the 1950s and 60s, back when that was a little bit more possible, so to speak. Something that we did not yet fully understand magnetic fields in the way that we do today, and people believed that a weakening magnetic field could lead to some sort of either solar-based or crustal-based catastrophe. He would later abandon crustal displacement theory because, let's be honest, that it's a ridiculous notion. Now, if you're sitting here going, Aiden, I don't know what crustal displacement theory is and I'm very confused. Well, that's understandable and I will explain it to you. I would recommend that you go watch our video on the Chan Thomas, the Adam and Eve story subject, which is an hour and a half long, but I don't expect you to go watch that right now, so I'll explain crustal displacement theory in a very short form to you. The basic idea is that every however many thousands of years, it varies depending on which author you're talking about, but it usually ranges from every six to 12,000 years, the Earth's magnetic poles weaken and flip, which allows the Earth's crust to slide over the mantle because of the weakening of the magnetic fields within the Earth, changing the form of a various level of spheres around inside of the Earth. I believe it's the asthenosphere, particularly, that weakens and becomes liquid and then the crust goes whoosh. Now, of course, this would cause an intense amount of earthquakes and probably volcanic eruptions, weather changes, tidal waves, tsunamis. It would be an absolute disaster that would destroy basically all civilization, if not all life on Earth at the non-microbial level. According to crustal displacement theory supporters, this has happened numerous times throughout human history, and the next one is coming soon. The problem with crustal displacement theory, of course, is that basically every single tenet of it can be disproved with basic science, or even logic. But aside from that, Fingerprints was making an argument that there was an ancient civilization, it was destroyed in some form of cataclysm, and the survivors taught the non-advanced civilizations how to actually reach the stage of being able to produce art and architecture and creative writing. But Fingerprints has been widely criticized for portraying this race as white. And because Graham portrayed this ancient advanced race as white, he's been accused of being a white supremacist. So I decided to buy the book to check on this because all of Graham's appearances since at least 2011 have no hint of him believing that this race was white or any specific color whatsoever. It seems that he just thinks that there was an ancient advanced civilization, and we don't really know, nor does it matter, what color their skin was. In Fingerprints, he cites Harold Osborne, a Cambridge-educated art historian, who claimed that the Spanish documents about the Inca referred to one of their gods, Viracocha, as being likened to appearance as Saint Thomas. Now, whether he meant Saint Thomas Aquinas or Saint Thomas the Apostle, it's unclear to me, as I haven't read Osborne's work, but in either case, 
there's there's some wiggle room here for how we might have come to this conclusion. Now, of course, St. Thomas the Apostle would not have been white. He would have been Jewish, a little bit darker skinned, and therefore would likely have matched the Viracocha if that was, of course, who was actually being compared. If they were comparing him to St. Thomas Aquinas, which seems unlikely to me, then yeah, that's how you would have assumed that person is white. I don't know who made the mix-up here. It could have been the Spanish, it could have been Osborne, and it could easily have been Hancock. But at no point does it seem to me like there was a deliberate attempt at white supremacy from Hancock specifically. Of course, this is supported by Spanish accounts of them being received as gods by many of the native people, and that is likely all stemming back to Spanish accounts of the Inca. He also cites some stuff from Ignatius Donnelly, who was an early impact theorist writing in the 19th century. That guy claimed that the sophisticated architecture and road systems used by the Inca had been constructed by a white race centuries beforehand. Now, of course, that, that one seems a little bit more like it's actually racist, but again, it's unclear if Graham was aware of how poor of a source this was. And that's generally what I found. Hancock was citing sources, and just, it seems he didn't do the due diligence of determining if these sources were reliable, not just anti-mainstream. Because there are sources that fall outside of the mainstream that are reliable, but the fact that they're outside of the mainstream is not what makes them reliable. And both Osborne and Donnelly are citing older Spanish sources, with Donnelly actually writing during the infancy of the field of archaeology. So I, I do think Graham chose his sources poorly for fingerprints, but I don't think there was a deliberate attempt at portraying these people as white against the evidence that they were not. I think that it was a, a legitimate mistake. This is partly due to the more recent work of his, where he has not referred to this ancient civilization as being any recognizable race that we would see today. And in the years since fingerprints came out, he has shifted his opinions as more and more scientific evidence has come to light. As I said before, crustal displacement is obvious nonsense, and in 2007, a team of scientists produced a paper that did pretty unequivocally show that there was an impact 12,800 years ago. So, Graham, rather than looking at the old crustal displacement theory, which made no sense, and seeing that science had adopted a new working theory, he went with the science. In fact, he no longer claims that Antarctica was the center of that civilization, or even that there was really only one of these civilizations. He seems open to the idea that there were a number of civilizations all over the world, or one civilization that sent people out across the world to share and spread that knowledge after the survivors of the cataclysm recollected. So that's what we're going to dive into in this video, is what exactly does Graham Hancock actually believe, and how is he supporting it in the Ancient Apocalypse series? If you ask the media in 2022, around the time that Ancient Apocalypse was announced and then released, you'd be told that he's a dangerous, racist pseudoscientist. Tellingly, basically every article that makes this claim cites fingerprints of the gods. They, and I believe this is deliberately, do not acknowledge that he was citing Spanish conquistadors, nor do they acknowledge that he himself has changed his opinions in the last 28 years. They constantly attack not his claims, but his character constantly choosing, rather than to actually argue with his points, to claim that he is a bad person. To suggest that he is a drug-addled secret racist. John Hoops, an archaeologist at the University of Kansas, rather than noting that Graham has moved on from some of his opinions in fingerprints, chooses instead to call it self-editing and claim that he's just hiding his true intentions. Because it's impossible that Graham Hancock has changed his opinions, has evolved on these issues. No, he must just be hiding his true opinions, because Occam's razor doesn't exist. But the fact of the matter is, if you're not obsessed with trying to slander Graham Hancock, and you actually listen to the things he said, you'd probably know that he has admitted that he got stuff wrong in Fingerprints of the Gods. And furthermore, Hoops takes absolutely no responsibility for the role that archaeologists have played in making Hancock into a superstar. You see, if the archaeological community had taken Hancock's suggestions even with some degree of seriousness, rather than immediately painting him as a fraud, they probably would not have the problem of Graham Hancock constantly attacking them. For example, Netflix sought permission to film at the Serpent Mound for the Ancient Apocalypse series. Unfortunately, the site's administration, working under the Department of Natural Resources in the state of Ohio, denied him. The reason was that their job, and I quote, 
was to ensure that Serpent Mound's integrity and preservation, both physically and in its historical preservation, are maintained. Because the presenter of this series proposes a theory and story that do not align with what we know to be true about Serpent Mound, your request is declined. Well, let's take a look at what the Academy knew about history. Troy was never real. It was just a mythical construct that Homer made up. And then Heinrich Schliemann determined that Troy was very much real. There were no megaliths constructed before the advent of agriculture, and that the advent of agriculture was 10,000 years ago. Well, we discovered Gobekli Tepe, which is absolutely a megalithic site, and it seems that agriculture probably developed around it a little bit earlier than we thought. We were also told that humans had only been in North America for 13,500 years. That was certain. It was the truth. Except, just last year, it was proven definitively that we were here at least 22,000 years ago. In fact, there is evidence that we were here 25,000 years ago, and there's a little bit of evidence, it's not conclusive, to suggest that we were here as early as 50,000 years ago. We were also told that there were no asteroid impacts in recent human history, but of course in 2007, Firestone and his team determined that, yes, there in fact was an impact 12,800 years ago. We were also told that there was no Hebrew writing prior to the 10th century BC, and then just last year, again, 2022, big year for archaeology, just last year, they discovered a lead tablet with writing on the inside of it in Hebrew that dates to the 13th century or the 12th century BC. The fact of the matter is, archaeologists and historians are wrong all the time. But that's actually okay. It is okay for academics to get things wrong, to interpret the evidence at hand in a way that makes sense. There's no problem with that. But what's absolutely unacceptable is denying somebody access to a public monument created by humans thousands and thousands of years ago just because you don't like their opinions. And what they consistently fail to recognize is that by doing this to Hancock, they are simply giving him more and more ammunition. Now, as a historian and a folklorist, I have no stake in this. I am not an archaeologist, and I am not Graham Hancock. However, what I do have is a very specific set of skills. So, using that set of skills, let's see how Graham's research and his suggestions, his theories, actually hold up. Now, with everything that I've already said in mind, Hancock opens up the first episode of the series, called Once There Was a Flood, with the claim that there was an advanced Ice Age human civilization. Now, how advanced? Not particularly sure, it's not made super clear, but we're not talking about flying cars. As for me, when I think about the possibility of an Ice Age civilization, one that we might be able to find traces of today, I think, you know, Copper or Early Bronze Age at the most, if not, you know, a more Neolithic sort of situation. To start off the segment, he presents the mainstream version of history, which is that the Ice Age ends, the hunter-gatherers start to transition to agriculture, and then after agriculture develops, we get the first human civilizations around 4000 BC. New discoveries, of course, keep pushing that date back for the advent of civilization, and one of those, he claims, is the site of Gunung Padang in Indonesia on the island of Java. Now, Gunung Padang is a site sitting atop a mountain which appears to be made out of man-made terraces. And, strewn about these man-made terraces and making up retaining walls within them, are thousands upon thousands of hexagonal basalt columns. Now, those blocks, as Graham Hancock notes, do naturally form in that shape as a result of volcanic activity. It does not appear that they were formed into their hexagonal fashion by human hands. And, because the site is mistakable for a natural rock formation, nobody really bothered to look into it for a long time, Graham says. Now, he's partially correct about that. The site was first mentioned in an academic context in 1890 by Roger Ferbuch, uh, and then again by Nicholas Chrome in 1914, and then it wasn't actually studied until 1979. However, the first man to discover it, uh, and not necessarily the first man to discover it, but the first person to write about it and bring it back to the world of academics, Verbuch, described it as a succession of four terraces connected by steps of rough stone, paved with rough flat stones, and decorated with numerous sharp and columnar upright andesite stones, on each terrace a small mound, possibly a grave. So clearly, they knew this was a man-made structure from the jump. 
And what Graham was right about is that for the first 90 or so years that we knew about it, nobody was really looking at it, but he was entirely wrong to suggest that they didn't think it was man-made from the start. Of course, the Indonesian government finally became aware of this site in 1979 and launched excavations and started academically surveying the site from the 1980s. Graham then shifts to discussing the work of an Indonesian archaeologist by the name of Dr. Ali Akbar, who started excavating the site in 2011 and 2012, up through 2014. Now, Akbar expected that this site would only be about 2,500 years old at the most, and was pretty stunned to discover that he might be wrong about that. Now, Akbar is no hack, he is a professor of archaeology at the University of Indonesia. And in September of 2014, as work was about to end on this site in preparation for a change of government, of course this was a government-funded project, he gave a talk, and in that talk he dated this site to 4500 BC, a full 6,500 years ago. That is considerably older than anybody expected it would be. Now, something interesting happened here. I went, and obviously, just to get some of the basic information about Gunung Padang, I went and I started with Wikipedia so that I could go and check the citations. A lot of the citations were in Indonesian, that was difficult, but I was able to find enough in English. That Wikipedia page just does not mention Akbar. It refers to Nawajaja's dating as fringe, doesn't mention that Akbar as an archaeologist is pretty confident about the 4500 date, and instead just goes to Nawajaja's suggestion that there could have been people there 11,600 years ago, or even later than that. Now, the only reason I can think that you would focus on Danny's work and not on Akbar's work is because you don't want people to know that there was a legitimate archaeologist making these claims. On the Wikipedia page, we get three dates that range from the 8th century AD to the 1st century BC. We don't get any mention of Akbar's dating. And interestingly enough, it's also left out that the secretary for Akbar's team back in 2014 said that work halted due to a transfer of government, and they weren't sure if they would have the funding to continue it, but based on what they had, they planned to submit a paper which noted a number of findings, including evidence of a giant building structure under the surface. Not Nawajaja, Akbar's work. The team recommended further research, as they had suggested that by drilling 14 meters into the ground, they had come up with even more stuff that appeared it could be anthropogenic. That said, they made no claims that they had absolutely discovered an ancient unknown civilization, just that there was some weird stuff here and they thought that excavation was worth it. This of course led to other archaeologists speaking out against the project, but their reasoning may not have been archaeological, but rather political. One critic, a Desriel Riva Shanti, criticized the methodology of the dig, but the problem was, according to her, she never actually visited the site and had just seen photographs. In some of those photographs, she saw soldiers, provided by the Indonesian government, digging at the outsides of the site with hoes, not digging into the actual site itself, just, you know, getting to it. This was enough for her to suggest that the methodology behind this dig was so bad that it shouldn't even be investigated. And to be clear, she had never been to the site just seen pictures. And, as it turns out, a number of Indonesian archaeologists were jockeying for funding around this time, with the change in government coming up, and Akbar's project being cancelled would have freed up quite a bit of money for them, about $250,000. And which site did, uh, did Desiril Riva Shanti want funded? Well, it happened to be one that her own institution was in charge of that had been undergoing excavations since 2003. To me, this does not exactly come across as an unbiased opinion. Another interesting thing that Akbar found is that the columnar rocks used to construct this site were not native to the site. They had been imported from somewhere else. While being interviewed for the documentary, Akbar says that they're uncertain of the true age of this site, but that they have discovered two distinct cultural layers. A cultural layer in archaeology is a section that has a remnant of human artifacts that can all be grouped together and dated to a specific time period. The first cultural layer, which they find on the surface, he dated to about 500 BC, and then the other one that was about 4 meters down was dated to about 5200 BC. And then there's the issue of those columns. They are clearly cut and positioned by human hands, not that they were carved by human hands, but the already hexagonal blocks were cut in half into 1.5 meter sections. And then these were all deliberately placed to form a sort of retaining wall around the terrace structures. According to Hancock and Nawajaja, what they might be looking at here is the top of a sort of pyramid in that it has terraced sides, but that it isn't rectangular. 
And if Gunung Padang is in fact that old, then it would be the oldest pyramid in the world by about 500 years. Now, Ajaja, on the other hand, thinks that it may be even older. Using a number of different ground penetration tools, they were able to determine what was actually in the interior of the hill that Gunung Padang sits atop. They were using ground penetrating radar, resistivity tomography, and seismic tomography, and they located a void that is roughly rectangular, which they believed to be a man-made chamber underground. And with further scans, they believe they've found three of these chambers, which are all connected via tunnels. And they run, basically, in a line down the axis of the site. So when you look at that, what we have here is an actual archaeologist who's come up with some pretty firm dates, and then we've got a geologist working on his team who's looked deeper underground using the available tools and found that there's a kind of a void down there. There's a spot where there should be earth and there isn't. But archaeologists claiming to know that there was no megalithic, no monumental architecture going on that long ago have said that it's not worth investigating the site. We already know when there were people here, when there was civilization, why would we go looking for more? You see, 5,200 years ago, they believed that the only people there were hunter-gatherers. Archaeologists are pretty firm. 5,200 BC, there was nobody doing monumental architecture anywhere, let alone here. In fact, it's believed that there were only hunter-gatherers in Indonesia. To me, from the outside in, you know, taking an objective perspective on this, it seems like the geologists have found evidence of something, and it's the archaeologists who are refusing to actually excavate it. Once again, because of the failure of the archaeological community, you can't say Hancock is wrong because he has no evidence. He has all the evidence he's capable of gathering. The archaeologists aren't actually investigating what that evidence means. Now, that said, there is a point to be made in defense of the archaeologists, which is that a project like this would be absolutely massive and require an extraordinary amount of funding. As a comparison, there were $250,000 allocated for the Gunung Padang dig to Akbar's team. When it comes to a site of similar scale and importance, Gebekli Tepe, the Turkish government allocated $15 million in 2016 to continue excavations and preservation work. So the question seems to be, why aren't archaeologists as a whole pushing for more funding for this project? If it is only due to the belief that nobody was capable of a building like this until 2000 BC, then they're not doing their jobs. Because if this is in fact a building from that long ago, that is very good evidence that we were capable of buildings like this before 2000 BC. But as I said, there's more than just Akbar's 5200 BC date, because Nawajaja has dated it even earlier than that, but again, there is very circumstantial evidence for this. He believes that their drilling has revealed yet another cultural layer that dates to about 9600 BC, which would be about the exact date of Meltwater Pulse 1b. And then he even goes so far as to say there may be yet another cultural layer that dates to 24,000 years ago. Of course, the evidence for this is entirely unpublished, and it's not explained exactly what those artifacts were that they drilled up to suggest this date. Now, Graham's explanation for how this would be possible, this 24,000 to 11,600 year old civilization that they believe is deep under the ground, all comes from something called Sundaland, which is what the community has termed the ancient above ground landmass that is now Indonesia. The island of Java, he claims, was not an island 24,000 years ago, and he's completely correct in that. Most of what has been termed Sundaland sunk beneath the ocean about 15,000 to 11,600 years ago. Now, Graham has been criticized for the numbers he has given when it comes to Meltwater Pulse 1b in the past. Sometimes he said as much as 500 meters of sea level rise. It obviously wasn't that. And in this documentary, he says it was 120 meters. And I have to point out, that is the correct amount of sea level rise. According to Penn State University, sea levels have risen about 130 meters in the last 20,000 years. So in reality, Graham actually undershot by 10 meters. Now, about 20 meters of that sea level rise occurred between 20,000 and 15,000 years ago. This was followed by Meltwater Pulse 1a, which lasted about 1,000 years from 15,000 to 14,000 years ago. During this period, sea levels rose about another 30 meters, and generally over the course of a millennium. It wasn't super sudden. This was followed by Meltwater Pulse 1b 11,600 years ago, where sea levels rose about 80 meters, 
Now, this again was over the course of about 20 years, and it wasn't to current levels, it was to about 20 meters below the current sea level. But in the first 100 years, we got a pretty big portion of that sea level rise. Ice cores have suggested that the first few dozen to the first 100 years of Meltwater Pulse 1b saw a rate of sea level rise of about 25 centimeters per year for a total of 25 meters, and that's if we're taking, you know, the the, the conservative estimate for how slow this was. And then after that 25 meters, it slows considerably and you get a, a kind of crawl towards modern, modern sea levels. And that information comes from On the Hemispheric Origins of Meltwater Pulse 1A by William Richard Potter of the University of Toronto in Quaternary Science Reviews 2005 for anybody who wants to fact check me. And if you do fact check me and I turned out to be wrong about how I interpreted that, please tell me because I would love to learn. So when it comes to the sea level rise issue and the fact that Java could have been well and truly connected to a much larger civilization, he's, he's kind of right about the circumstances. He also rightfully points out that the existence of hunter-gatherers in a region does not preclude the existence of a more advanced civilization. And in broadening this point about a larger civilization around Sundaland, not just Java, he connects to a place called Nan Madal. Now, Nan Madal sits 3,000 miles away from Java in Micronesia, and Micronesia has some monumental sites of its own constructed out of basalt columns. Graham rightfully mentions that the archaeological community has dated the visible structures at Nan Madal on the island of Pompeii to about 800 or 900 years ago. So, these, these things were built when Europe was going through the medieval period. Archaeologists do also believe that the island of Pompeii, however, was inhabited from about 2,000 years ago. Graham is not so sure he agrees with that one. This is partially because the building materials used at Nan Madal are the same as the ones used at Gunung Padang, which of course he believes is much older than 800 or 900 years. It is also important to note, however, that while they are both basalt hexagonal columns, they were quarried in different locations. Now, Graham's issue with dating here isn't just because of these columns. It's because he's discovered a number of underwater pillars, not necessarily that he discovered them, they were discovered back in the 70s, but there's a number of underwater pillars that he thinks could signal older construction, older architecture, than just what is on the surface from back when the sea levels were lower. Part of this reasoning behind there being a larger, older architectural project beneath the waves is a local oral tradition which claims that there was an ancient city known as Kanem Weso that was underwater now, and that it had been built long before the current population arrived. Now, that's pretty intriguing, and it's great evidence for Graham's point. He shows us these pillars, and they really do look like maybe there was something built there a long time ago. So I had to check on it, and what I found is that in the 2010s, a team of researchers from primarily the United States and Japan actually looked into this. They surveyed the site, they found the columns, and they actually brought one of them up to the surface to drill through it and see if they got to basalt underneath the coral that covered the outside. But what they found was that, in fact, these pillars were solid coral. There was no stone inside of them. They were purely natural formations as far as anybody could tell. And it, it did not take me long to find the Ishimura team's research, so I'm not sure why Graham didn't know about this. I'm trying to give him the benefit of the doubt that he simply didn't know and not that he knew and chose to omit the information that proves that the non medal point is a non-starter. That said, I am no expert on the ocean and the life within it, so I don't know why coral would form into a pillar structure, but I'm also not going to assume that there's some man-made reason for it. But from here, we switch gears to talk about the Younger Dryas period and Meltwater Pulse 1b, which is what I just described to you a little bit ago. He does correctly describe the Younger Dryas as a period of immense and sudden cooling after what had been a gradual warming period, which then ends suddenly about 1,200 years after it began with Meltwater Pulse 1b. Graham claims that this was a series of deluges, to use the word he uses. From what I can see, it seems that there was one big one right at the beginning, and then from there, it was just kind of gradual. And of course, that discussion, that, that use of Meltwater Pulse 1b, is to make the suggestion that sea levels used to be lower, and therefore it's not unreasonable that there could be more underwater sites around the Java Sea or even out into the Pacific. And to be honest, that, is, that isn't unreasonable to suggest that there could be more underwater structures, but 
Nan Madol is not good evidence. It's extremely weak because we know that the current structure was only built in the, the Middle Ages, essentially, and that the structure beneath it, structure, is just solid coral. And following this, Graham does what becomes kind of the theme in the series, where he moves from the archaeological into the cultural, talking about the myths and the legends and the stories of these people as they relate to our archaeological finds. In this case, that's the mention of the many flood stories from all over the world. And much like Noah, Utnapishtim, the story of Ragnarok involving the Norse gods, and Yima of the Zoroastrian cataclysm story, the Indonesians have their own flood story as well. And to be clear, Yima is ice, not flood, but also cataclysm. Now, many skeptics have attributed these flood stories to simply being local myths because early people lived near water, near rivers a lot of the time, and those rivers would often flood, and then you get flood myths out of that. But with the knowledge of Meltwater Pulse 1B's existence, I find it lacking to suggest that this global flood story is just about rivers and localized flooding events. It seems more likely to me that this is a memory of a time when the oceans suddenly got a lot higher. And he spends a little bit of time on the flood angle, but he really just kind of tells us what the Indonesian flood myth is, and that's kind of how the episode ends. So at this point, we're going to analyze what went on in that episode before we move on to episode two. And to do this, I've kind of wrapped up his main points and what I think of them. First of all, Graham absolutely has the evidence, via the work of Akbar and Nawajaja, to posit that there is an older structure underneath the pyramid, the, the monument, whatever we're going to call it, at Gunung Padang. He absolutely does not have proof of an older civilization, an older structure. He just has the evidence to suggest it is worth looking into. All of the arguments I've seen against excavating Gunung Padang have either relied on older work or have come from people who have a political reason or a financial reason to want Akbar's work halted. My opinion, as it currently stands, with the evidence being what it is, is that it is now on the archaeologists to explain why that gap, that void that Nawajaja found, and the cultural lair that dates to 5200 BC are not intriguing. It is up to them to explain why we don't need to actually go look into that in a manner that is not simply, well, the stuff we currently know about says that that's unlikely. If they're not willing to do that, then they should excavate the site and either prove Graham to be right or wrong. As I said, the current reasoning seems to be either political, financial, or simply that they're lazy. I don't know which it is. But if they're simply ignoring new evidence because it's inconvenient or expensive to look at it, then they can't claim to be right and claim that Graham is wrong. Graham is also correct about the significant rapid sea level rise around 9600 BC. As I said, this is to the tune of 25 centimeters or 10 inches per year conservatively for that first 100 years. Both science and tradition have shown us evidence that this flood happened, and it's really a matter of debate as to how advanced we actually were beforehand. Now, that said, Gunung Padang is located 885 meters above sea level and is not near the coast. So to me, it seems unlikely that the abandonment of this structure was due to flooding in the immediate vicinity. If anything, it was probably that it was an important cultural complex, but that culture was so devastated by flooding that it fell out of use. And of course, that is only if it is in fact that old, which remains to be seen. And finally on this subject, Graham's evidence regarding Nan Madal and a possible larger, broader ancient civilization is rendered null due to tests on that coral. Now, there could be structures out there, but the one he used is definitely just coral. So if the goal of the first episode was to introduce us to the concept of ancient lost civilizations and this great flood, the second episode serves to introduce us to the concept of the survivors. And to do this, we're taking a look primarily at Mexico, and the beginning of the episode focuses on the city of Cholula and the Great Pyramid that actually resides there. As Graham says, Cholula is the oldest continuously inhabited city in Mexico, having been established sometime between 800 BC and 200 BC. Archaeologists believe that the original inhabitants of the area were Oto Manguean speakers, possibly from what would be modern day Honduras or Nicaragua, and that they would not have been ancestors of the Aztec or Toltec people who would come to lo locate themselves in that site later. Graham then pretty immediately makes a point of faulting the Spanish conquistadors for the level of destruction of both human life, property, and the many traditions that would have existed within that society, 
and says that this is the reason that we have probably lost so much information about Mexico. I will say it's important to, well, I'm not downplaying the tragedy of what happened to the people of Cholula, it is important to note that the conquistadors killed 6,000 people in a city of 100,000 and did not completely devastate the city. But a lot of people did die of disease afterwards and the city never regained its former status, but it was not completely destroyed, as he kind of suggests. But the method by which the Spanish conquered Cholula is not really the focus of Cholula in this episode. Of course, as I said, it's the really, really big pyramid. The thing about that pyramid is that even when the Spanish got there, it basically looked like a large, oddly geometric hill. It was completely overgrown with grass and even trees, and they knew so little about what was underneath it that they built a church on top of it. And as far as we know, it might have been in that state of disrepair and neglect since the 12th century when the Toltecs got there. While the Great Pyramid was an impressive structure and already there, the Toltecs chose to build their own newer temple to use as their site of worship. Now, it's hard to put into words exactly how big this pyramid is, so I'm just going to give you numbers. According to the archaeologist Jeff McCafferty, who is one of the experts on the site, it is 400 meters by 400 meters wide and 66 meters tall. That is like constructing a 20-story building with a footprint the size of 16 soccer fields. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, anything but the metric system. Constructed of mud and adobe bricks, this pyramid is the largest man-made structure on Earth. Now, the last work on the building was done just before the Toltecs conquered it and it fell into disrepair, but evidence suggests that it has been around and was being worked on for much longer than that. Excavating beneath the overgrowth and then tunneling deep within the pyramid, the archaeologists working the site, who were then primarily Mexican and Spanish, were able to find altars and murals and all sorts of other stuff deep within this structure. Excavating beneath the overgrowth and then tunneling into the structure itself, archaeologists working since 1931 have uncovered murals, altars, and courtyards deep within the pyramid. In fact, workers eventually dug out a full 8 kilometers of tunnels, of which about 800 meters are open to the public today. But the super interesting thing about what that tunneling revealed was that the Great Pyramid of Cholula is actually a series of pyramids built on top of each other. Hancock presents the four known stages of this pyramid's construction, but he starts with 1520, the, the, the top, the newest layer, and I have to take issue with that because that was actually completed in the early 1200s and not the 1500s. So he, that date's wrong. Also, it is possible that work may have stopped as early as the 800s. So I'm not sure why Graham used the 1520 date. Might have just been a misunderstanding. But according to Dr. Jeff McCafferty, who I mentioned earlier, the beginnings of this ceremonial complex are in 500 BC. And I was not content with just using the interview tidbits, so I went back and actually read the 17-page paper that Jeff McCafferty wrote on the site back in 1996. In the abstract, McCafferty mentions that work on the pyramid, academic published work, is pretty scattered and very little summarization is available. According to him, this has led to a general lack of understanding about the pyramid and a lack of coherent work on it. And he's not wrong, I had a lot of trouble locating any reliable details about the pyramid, including the dimensions. I had to go to this specific paper to find an academic source on the dimensions. McCaffrey lists four primary stages along with nine substages, and the main stages are a 120 meter square base with a 17 meter altitude, followed by a 180 meter square base and a 35 meter height, and then a 350 meter square base with a 66 meter height, and then a 400 meter square base with a 66 meter height. A map that is included in that document also shows that all the pyramids are built atop themselves. So it's like a Russian nesting doll, although it's not an exact like concentric centered situation. They're kind of off to the edges of the taller pyramids built on top of them. The pyramid itself was constructed over a natural spring, contains a number of chambers, and also is oriented to face the sun. Specifically, it's oriented to face the sunset on the winter solstice. And also, according to McCafferty's interview, there was a team that discovered a chamber deep within, but 
never went back and their research was never published. Now, it could be that they lacked the funding or that whatever was in there wasn't interesting enough for them to actually look at, but the fact that nothing published exists kind of opens up the door for conspiracy theories. And as far as dating for that first pyramid goes, it was primarily dated using ceramics found at the site. Graham notes the sacred nature of the terraced pyramid as well as that natural spring, and then draws a connection to Gunung Padang and suggests that there is a pattern of these types of pyramids built over an existing sacred site all across the world. He argues that it could be that these sacred chambers came first and the pyramids were built atop those uh, to sort of memorialize them. That would mean that these locations of these sacred sites were based on nature, not some sort of man-made design. Graham also links the orientation of the Cholula and Giza pyramids, considering both of them are astronomically aligned, and suggests that these are related, but the phenomena to which they're aligned are entirely different and unconnected. He also says that it is a mystery that these similarities exist when these cultures allegedly never came into contact with each other. But truth be told, it, it isn't a mystery at all. Many cultures have associated the sky with the domain of the gods and have built monuments to get as high as they can. A pyramid, of course, given the materials available at the time, was the best way to build an artificial mountain to get yourself closer to the sky. And then the sacred spring argument isn't great either because a lot of cultures have sacred springs but do not have pyramids. One such example of people associating the sky with the heavens actually comes from the Bible. We have the Tower of Babel that they were building for the purpose of reaching up to heaven, up to God's domain, and of course it's, it's destroyed, but that tells us some of the motivation behind ancient people building these things. And as I said, Giza is aligned north and Cholula is aligned to face the winter solstice sunset, so the connection there on astronomical grounds is pretty tenuous. Now, Graham does acknowledge the argument that this might have had something to do with reaching the sky and therefore the heavens, and claims that it falls flat due to very specific spiritual ideas, namely what happens to us after death and how that's intertwined with the pyramids. He says that the pyramids are basically all tombs of some sort, but that's not entirely true because Mesopotamian ziggurats, which are what is believed to have possibly inspired the Giza pyramids, do not in fact act as tombs, but serve a specific temple function. And then he also claims that it's unlikely that pyramids developed all over the world independently of each other. That one's a little bit more difficult to address as countering it with things like agriculture and permanent housing leads to the question, well, what if those things were also passed down to us? One argument I would raise to address that is timing. If these pyramids, if this building technique was passed down to us from survivors of that ancient civilization, why don't they show up for five to 10,000 years after the flood? Shouldn't they be 11,000 years ago, not you know, more recent? Of course, that is the very next thing he addresses. And McCafferty says that no carbon dating has been done on the earliest structure of the pyramid when prompted by Graham. McCafferty then says that the oldest that it could possibly be based on the ceramics they found is 1000 BC. And when, again, prompted by Graham, does say that this is not enough to firmly suggest the beginnings of civilization in Mexico. It's it does seem to me that this may have been edited to be a little bit more mysterious than it was supposed to be. McCafferty seems to me to be talking more about Mexico as a whole and possibly the site of Cholula, but in a sense that the ancient, ancient history of Mexico is not properly understood, not that this specific pyramid might be 10,000 years old. And of course, Graham says immediately after this that he's not disputing Cholula's age, but that there are older pyramids and older structures in Mexico. Namely, he shows the pyramids of La Venta and Cajuilco, which date to the 800s and 500s BC, respectively. Once again, after talking about the archaeology of this site, we go back to the ethnography, which is the cultural analysis, talking about the beliefs and practices of a group of people, not just the artifacts that they left behind. Graham tells us that according to the people who were inhabiting Cholula at the time of the Spanish arrival, the Aztecs, that pyramid was built by a race of giants. I did fact check this one a little bit. He appears to be correct about that. And in this story, something you might find familiar happened. A race of giants lived in Mexico and they were wiped out by a flood. One of those giants, Cholua the architect, is the one who designed and directed construction of the Great Pyramid. 
After the flood, there were seven giants who survived, and one of them, Cholhua, is the one who actually oversaw, designed, and constructed the pyramid. And there is plenty to dig into regarding giants in this story and giants in many other stories and how this is actually oddly similar to many of them from very, very disparate parts of the world, but we've got a different video on that coming up, so we're not going to do that here. But to give you a brief summary, we get flood stories that involve giants from the Aztecs, the Norse, the Greeks, the Jews, the Christians, and several other cults. Once again, cult is not necessarily being used in the term that you might associate with it. It is used in the term of ancient religious groups dedicated to a specific deity or pantheon. But there is a problem with using this specific myth as evidence for any sort of ancient race that was lost building this creation, this complex. And that's the fact that the Aztecs are not the people who built that first temple. In fact, the Aztecs were not even in the region at the time that the first pyramid at Cholula was built. The Toltecs eventually moved into the region, but the people who built the pyramid were most likely neither Aztec nor Toltec or even Maya. They seem to have been, as I mentioned earlier, Otomanguean speakers from further south. Now, to be perfectly clear, we don't know for certain who built the first pyramid. It could have been Mexica peoples, but we, we don't know, and the current scholarship suggests it was not Aztec or Toltec-related people. And in fact, the Aztecs, and almost certainly the Toltecs, weren't involved in any stage of the pyramid's construction at all. It seems that the entire thing was built by whoever initially lived there. And it is possible that the Aztecs got the story from the Toltecs, but like I said, the Toltecs aren't the original people. So the Toltecs, were they referring to the people they conquered as the, the giants, or would this have been people who lived there before the people they conquered? And if so, where'd they get that story? Now, all of that said, it is possible that the people who built that first pyramid did in fact share in a sort of pan-Mesoamerican religion, the one that we observe as far back as the Olmecs, but it's not certain. So that's not to say that the story about giants being involved in the construction of the pyramid is completely and totally false. It's just to note that there are gaps in what Hancock is kind of presenting as a linear progression. But, of course, this is Graham's narrative and he just continues along asking the question, what if these physical giants were in fact intellectual giants instead? What if we're misunderstanding the reference to them as being large and it's actually supposed to be people of great intelligence and technological advancement? And Hancock goes on to make a point about how archaeologists tend to look at myths as just that, fiction, legends, creations of humans trying to understand the past. And I'll give it to him, he's got a bit of a point there. I often run into archaeologists who are not super concerned with mythical stories because they think that they are just made up. And then you've got archaeologists who are a little bit more open to looking at, all right, well, here's the physical evidence of these people, what's the backstory from their traditions? It's not all archaeologists that are unwilling to look at myths, but he's not wrong to say that there's a significant number of them that will discount these stories off the bat just because they're stories. That said, the, the gap between the disaster he's proposing and the construction of these pyramids is so wide that it just becomes implausible. Either there is a missing link here that we, we have not yet uncovered, or Graham is just wrong about these pyramids being the result of some sort of advanced Atlantean civilization that managed to help other people. The thing is, Graham believes he has that evidence, and there's a couple other places in Mexico that he cites. One of those is Texcatzinga. Texcatzinga is, of course, a botanical garden that was an imperial Aztec creation outside of the city of Texcoco. Now, Texcatzingo was constructed in the 15th century by one of the rulers of the city-state of Texcoco, but Hancock kind of has some other suggestions. He calls the hill upon which the complex is built a natural pyramid, but to be quite honest, it's not. It's a hill. But we are also watching a Netflix series that is supposed to you know, draw you in and make you interested, so I guess we're letting him get away with calling a hill a natural pyramid. I would argue that a pyramid is an artificial hill, not the other way around. That said, what is left of these gardens does involve some pretty extraordinary engineering, especially for a people who never developed ironworking. Like the original pyramid at Cholula, this one was dedicated to the rain and fertility god Tlaloc, but of course the pyramid 
at Cholula was eventually rededicated to Quetzalcoatl. Now, as for Tlaloc, his worship is attested to at least 500 AD, which makes him 800 years earlier than the Aztecs got there. But it's also possible that this deity developed out of an older rain deity that was worshiped by the Olmecs that we have evidence of. It is believed that Texcatzingo was constructed at the behest of the Texcoco ruler. I'm gonna try so hard. Nezahualcayotl. But as he is wont to do, Graham asks if it is possible that this was just a renovation or an addition to an older structure. Now, of course, Graham likes to bring experts into the show to help him, and one of those people he brings in is Italian businessman and amateur archeologist who currently lives in Mexico City, a man by the name of Marco Vigato. Now, to be clear, amateur does not mean wrong. Heinrich Schliemann was an amateur and he found Troy. But I must say that I looked into Marco's work and I could not find him anywhere on JSTOR or any other academic research tool for that matter. He seems to have written a couple of books and an article, more of a blog post really, on the Great Pyramid and Khufu. It's 15 reasons why Khufu did not build the Great Pyramid. I haven't read it. He also wrote The Empires of Atlantis. But like I said, I could not find a single academic scholarly review of any of his work. So it's kind of, it was kind of hard to fact check it because I, I couldn't get my hands on a copy in time and I didn't have time to read the whole thing. So it's not necessarily to say that Marco is off the bat wrong about anything he says, but he is a much weaker source for this than a guy like McCafferty or Akbar. So it's kind of a bad look for Hancock, but it doesn't necessarily render what he's saying wrong. As evidence of this site being that old, Vigato points to the weathering on some of the stones that are there. Now, he claims that it would have taken thousands of years for these stones to weather as much as they have because they're very hard. Now, Obviously stone is hard. He's saying that in terms of the hardness scale of stone, these are very, very tough. Now there's a few issues here. For example, what kind of stone was used to construct this is not actually mentioned. And I don't love that because I feel like that's a pretty deliberate one to leave out because it makes it really hard to fact check. I spent a long time on the internet trying to figure out what kind of stone Texcatzingo was made of, and there was no information on it anywhere. I will say, if anything, Hancock's series has convinced me that far more money needs to be poured into archeological excavations in Mexico, because there's a lot of really interesting stuff here, but apparently there's not been a ton of work done. And I'm not just taking that from Hancock. McCafferty had the same opinion. So I tried to figure out what type of stone this could be, it's clearly not basalt, which is one stone that the Aztecs worked with a lot. The two most likely possibilities appear to be either granite or limestone. If it's limestone, then this entire thing falls flat because limestone is a pretty soft rock. However, if it's granite, there may be some argument here. I went to the National Park Service because the best information I could find about granite monuments being weathered was about Mount Rushmore. According to them, it should erode at about one-tenth of an inch every thousand years. So for Texcatzinga, granite would have weathered it by just over one-twentieth of an inch, which would be almost imperceptible to the naked eye. However, all of that may be inconsequential when you look at what they're actually pointing out as Aztec versus older. Much of the site is absolutely of Aztec construction. It's barely weathered at all, and it's pretty clearly different from the stuff that they're suggesting was there earlier. We're talking about megaliths that are more rounded and kind of laying on their side. We're talking about sort of rooms carved out of the bedrock. Those could well be older, and I don't think it's ridiculous, and I'm not even sure that archaeologists would argue with somebody suggesting that there was a sacred nature to this site before the Aztecs built a garden there. In fact, it faces Mount Flaloc. It's actually pointing at another mountain that is sacred to the rain god. However, the site being in use and having some human modifications does not really suggest that it was some sort of complex ancient site that was then worked over. It could be, but unless we can find some Aztec record of what was there beforehand, we'll probably never know precisely what it looked beforehand. Graham then goes on to connect this site to the discovery of yet another artifact related to Tlaloc, a very, 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 very big carved stone statue. It was found in a dried up riverbed and is carved from a single piece of stone, making it the largest single cut stone monument in the Americas, and it was dated to around 700 AD. 
and to quote Graham Hancock, that is, long before the Aztecs dominated these lands, which is correct. He says that this means it's, in fact, likely that Tlaloc was worshipped by groups before the Aztecs and the Toltecs, but that's not really something that archaeologists and historians dispute. And I will say this is one thing that Graham does throughout the series that I can't tell if it is deliberate or just that he's been thinking this way for so long that this is how he talks, but he kind of mixes the stuff that archaeologists argue with versus the stuff that archaeologists accept. He'll often say, archaeologists don't accept this thing, but then when he moves on, not make it clear that they do in fact agree with him on other things like these dates. As I said, there are Olmec sculptures that look a lot like the later Tlaloc sculptures, and it's possible that they knew him by a different name, but were in fact worshipping a similar deity who may have evolved into what we now know as Tlaloc. And the reason this is brought up is to bring in the Flood myth, to, to address that part of this story, because of course we have to connect it to the previous episode. And Tlaloc, of course, is the god behind the, the Flood of Aztec mythology. It was his decision to flood the world, and this Flood is what gives way, in, in Hancock's version of events, to the arrival of Quetzalcoatl. Now, the earliest appearance of the Quetzalcoatl figure that I could find was either the first century BC or the first century AD, is the first time we see somebody in Aztec, Mayan, or related theology or religion that matches this figure. But Graham's Quetzalcoatl narrative is flawed, and to be perfectly honest, I'm not sure why. But the truth is, he talks about Quetzalcoatl arriving from the east on a boat after this flood has subsided. In reality, there are a number of origin stories for Quetzalcoatl, but almost all of them involve him being the god that actually creates humanity out of the bones of whatever race preceded us that was destroyed by the last cataclysm. As for the story about Quetzalcoatl arriving from the east, this all actually seems to stem from a story about him being tricked by one of his brothers into, uh, I will say, gallivanting about with his own sister, uh, after which the shame, because he was under the influence of drugs when it happened, uh, the shame leads him to do one of two things. In one version of the story, he goes and builds a funeral pyre and immolates himself on the beach, and in the other, he builds himself a raft and sails off into the east never to return. One thing that is not mentioned in these stories is a, at least before the Spanish get there, there are no extant stories that we know of pre-Spanish arrival that involve a prophecy of Quetzalcoatl returning. He is not expected to come back. This isn't King Arthur. This is a different story entirely. And it seems like this whole thing with him coming back stems from the Spanish narratives of Cortez's arrival and his being received as a sort of god. Graham also claims in his narrative of Quetzalcoatl that he was driven off the first time by supporters of a war god. So this makes it sound like he arrived, he taught everybody about civilization, and then the followers of a war god drove him off so he could return one day. That's not the Aztec version of the story. Now, whether this is because Graham simply misunderstood or read older scholarship and hasn't addressed any of the changes since is unclear to me. It could also be that he's being deliberately deceptive. I will admit that. I don't know his motivations. I am just reporting to you what he said and how it lines up with what we know. But this, this narrative is very important to the specifics of the story Graham has concocted here. Because what he says is that this ties in to great civilizing figures from other mythologies. Namely, he gives us Prometheus, Viracocha, and Maui. Those, of course, being a titan of Greek mythology a god of Inca mythology, and then, yet again, a god of the Polynesian mythology. Now, there is something to be said for those suggestions, because Prometheus, Maui, and Viracocha actually line up a lot better than Quetzalcoatl matches up with any of these people, so it's weird that Quetzalcoatl is the one that was used as the sort of linchpin for this argument, because he's the only one that doesn't fit, but I think Graham needed the pyramids in Mexico to work with his theory, and unfortunately this seems to be a case of possibly just his confirmation bias getting the better of him. But there is an argument that that is made, it's just not made very well in my opinion, but Marco Vigato is of the opinion that the temple at Chochicalco, 
bears a record of the prophecy of Quetzalcoatl's return or of the first time Quetzalcoatl got there. It's, it's, it's kind of... It, it doesn't make a ton of sense, if I'm being perfectly honest. Now, that site is believed to have been inhabited first around 200 BC, with most of the architecture we see today being constructed between 700 and 980. Two temples sit atop the hill, the larger of which we believe is dedicated to Tlaloc, or at least some sort of rain god, and the smaller of the two being dedicated to Quetzalcoatl. And once again, Hancock refers to Quetzalcoatl as a civilizing figure rather than a creator god, which is not up to date with the scholarship. And once again, I know it might seem a little weird that I'm relying on the academics sometimes and kind of blasting them at the other times. This is really about who has the better evidence. In cases like Gunung Padang, the archaeologists are not the ones with the most evidence right now. They in fact have very little evidence that they're right because a lot of evidence suggests they might not be. When it comes to this, Graham's the one lacking the evidence. There's no pre-Spanish documents that suggest that Quetzalcoatl was supposed to return, so he's relying on later stuff that was possibly written by people who didn't really know what they were talking about. So I know it might seem like I'm being a little bit wishy-washy or hypocritical here, but again, that's why I'm trying to go over what the evidence actually is for each of these things. Now, Graham and Vigado, who's the one who came up with this specific theory, seem to be saying all of this because there's a depiction of a feathered serpent on the temple, which, yes, we know that it's the temple of the feathered serpent, it's probably Quetzalcoatl, fine, got that, but it's the way they interpret some of the glyphs that starts to break from the archaeological understanding. Because Graham is claiming that this may depict a lost chapter of Quetzalcoatl's origin story. This is because Marco Vigato claims that one of the glyphs depicts Quetzalcoatl's arrival in Mexico from a different land. One of these is one that he describes as depicting a flaming temple with a serpent's tail coiled around it. And he says, and I quote, you could almost see that as a representation of an island. And I agree that you could almost see that as a representation of an island, but it is absolutely not definitive as a representation of an island. Hancock, of course, clarifies that we're talking about a burning temple with water washing over it, and Vigato says, yeah, that's what I mean. Another glyph shows a human being sitting with a coil beneath him that is interpreted as being a snake, and Vigato interprets the human being as being Quetzalcoatl. And because the figure is facing away from the temple, he interprets this as Quetzalcoatl leaving that temple, which represents an island, to come to Mexico. It's, it's a really shaky argument, especially considering the age of this temple, 700 AD, as well as the lack of any other documents supporting this origin for Quetzalcoatl. In the known origin stories, what we currently have, he's, he's born, he's the child of two other gods, he's the brother of several gods, he doesn't arrive from somewhere else. And once again, Graham Hancock does not dispute the dating for this temple at all. He says that he, he, he's not arguing with that. But he then does go on to say that while he recognizes that there was no cataclysm that occurred during this period, that the narrative it's depicting could be much older. And I can't totally argue with that, because yeah, it's likely that the first time something was written down is not the time that that story came to exist. We don't, it's not like these people were sitting down to write books the way we do today. They were writing down older oral traditions. So as far as he's concerned, this narrative that was described, depicted in 700 AD, could stretch all the way back to Mount Water Pulse 1b 11,600 years ago, or even earlier to the beginning of the Younger Dryas 12,800 years ago. But of course, the same problems apply here that have applied everywhere else. That's a really long time, and there's no other supporting documentation. Now, of course, not to solely criticize Graham Hancock, he does make a pretty salient point in this segment. He says that what we need is an archaeology of ideas. And yeah, you could suggest that history is that field, but history is kind of reliant upon archaeology, and archaeology doesn't love to follow the myths. So, while Hancock picked a pretty bad example in going with Quetzalcoatl, it doesn't mean that he's necessarily wrong about a lot of the similarities between these myths and the possible realities that they hearken back to. There are many motifs repeated again and again in folktales, legends, and mythologies, and it's worth considering that they may, in fact, contain some degree of truth. 
Now, when I set out to make this video, the idea was to watch the entire series, summarize the main points, and do some analysis on it, and decide whether or not I agree with Graham, or to what extent I agree with Graham. Unfortunately, about halfway through the first episode, I realized that was absolutely not going to happen, and so we're going to do these two or three episodes at a time, which means we've now reached the analysis point. First of all, there is absolutely something to be said about all of the many, 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 many stories of giants or gods or some sort of other divine being teaching humans how to do certain things that in, are involved in civilization, like make fire or build things. We see this in mythology from all over the world. Prometheus teaches humans how to make fire. The Watchers from the Book of Enoch teach humanity how to do things like make armor and makeup. So, looking into that, I do think it's interesting, the idea that all of these different societies claim that some outsider taught them how to do things. I think that's worth looking into, but I also think that some of the conclusions we've drawn so far are really tenuous. Additionally, Graham is a master at setting up his argument, basically allowing you to sense the gap so that he can then answer the gap in the very next segment. So that you always feel like, you know, you're asking questions and he's one step ahead of you. The thing is, on several occasions, he really has not properly filled that gap and he's relying on your being with him to carry you through the stuff he may have missed. For example, I did notice one thing that may be deliberate, but also may not, regarding Cholula. Graham does not address the belief that Cholula was built by a different group of people than the ones who told the story about its construction. And as I said before, the Manguean speakers who probably lived there and probably were responsible for at least the first pyramid may or may not have shared in some sort of pan-Mesoamerican belief system. If they didn't, it kind of throws a wrench in this whole story. Now, that said, archaeologists need some criticism here. Many, many, many of the attacks on the legitimacy of, you know, the, this sort of speculative archaeology regarding these ancient sites are based in the fact that these people think they already know the full history. They're unwilling to accept the possibility that they got something wrong, and that's not good. They seem to think that just because they know when civilization began in a certain location, it's impossible that they're missing evidence, and that's simply unacceptable. If we followed that, if that was our standard practice whenever we discover something weird, we wouldn't know about Troy, the Hittites, or whatever was going on at Gebekli Tepe, as well as plenty of other sites around the world. It is a perfectly valid criticism to say that archaeologists have not done their due diligence with a number of these sites, whether it be for lack of interest or lack of funding. And of course, lack of funding is a much more understandable one, and I wish that's the one they would go with. Make it about the fact that you can't get the money, and maybe people out there will help you get the money. You can crowdfund your dig site. It will work. So, because archaeologists typically don't approach these myths, whether it be for lack of funding or lack of interest, they can't really say that Graham is wrong, they can just say that he hasn't produced the evidence, but then again, he's kind of reliant on them to do their jobs. And then there's their way that they just address Graham, and rather than attack his work, as they sometimes do, they attack his character. And I wouldn't mind attacking somebody's character if there were a valid reason for it, or if you at least did the littlest bit of legwork while trying. For example, an Alex Griffin writing for EpicMagazine.com, studying for his PhD at the University of Lancaster, I am not doxing, this was the information given on the website, he decided to write an article called Ancient Apocalypse Isn't Just Wrong, It's Sinister. Which, let me just tell you, off the bat, reads to me like such aggressive and obvious propaganda that I'm immediately going to discount it. And, like, I'm a trained historian. What do you think your average person who's just, you know, curious is gonna do when they see you not argue with somebody's claims, but make up some BS about them being a white supremacist? They're gonna assume you're lying. But let's get into why I say that, because from the jump, it is very obvious that Alex has not done his work. He claims that Hancock's ancient civilization presented in Ancient Apocalypse is, and I'm not kidding about the term he uses, Caucasian coded. And this is entirely because of what was written in 1994 or 95's Fingerprints of the Gods. Now, as I said before, Graham Hancock did write in Fingerprints of the Gods that these figures like Viracocha and Quetzalcoatl appear to have been white based on descriptions. 
Now, as we said, he seems to have abandoned that because he probably recognized there's no real evidence of that, that it was all just taken from older sources written by Spaniards. But if you read Griffin's criticism of Hancock, you'll see it's identical to all of the articles that literally look like they were written by the same PR firm and just sent out to Slate and Medium and you know everybody else who would write an article about this, The Guardian even. He basically just looks like he read those articles and then decided that there was no more homework to be done on Graham. That it was just, you know what, I'm gonna believe whatever all of the different journalistic outlets say, despite the fact that they all say exactly the same thing, and it seems like this was coordinated and probably also funded, and maybe I'm being deliberately deceived here for some reason, but no, why would we ask those questions? Why would we notice the obvious propaganda when, you know, every single article says the exact same thing and they all came out at the exact same time? And by the way, it's not like this is the entire substance of the article. This is the first paragraph. This is the first body paragraph of the article. He tells us that Graham Hancock is a white supremacist because of something that he did not properly contextualize from 1995, 28 years before now. <laughs> and again, I came across Graham Hancock by watching him on Joe Rogan. I have watched hours and hours and hours of this man speak about this, and not once in those hours did he imply these were white people. So while I'm not saying that Hancock never said these people would have been white, I'm saying if you have to go all the way back almost 30 years to make your point, because the guy hasn't said anything remotely similar to that since, you're probably not making a good argument. In fact, you're doing just about as badly as Graham does when it comes to the Quetzalcoatl story. So as far as Griffin's work goes, it's never a good look to lie to your reader within the first 500 words. The, the author of this article then excuses himself, or herself, I actually don't know if this is a man or a woman, but excuses themselves from confronting any of Graham Hancock's better points by saying there's just too many of them and they're too ridiculous. So instead he focuses on episodes one and two, which leads me to believe that it's entirely possible he only watched episodes one and two, and I would not put it past this author based on the article I read. And it's it's pretty rough. For example, the author, Griffin, does not see the irony in criticizing Graham's dating of some things while providing three distinct different dates separated by a total of 800 to 900 years for Gunung Padang. And reading it, I can tell he lifted the entire section from Wikipedia and just reworded it because it reads almost exactly like the Wikipedia article. In fact, he does excuse why it took so long for archaeologists to recognize Gunung Padang as a man-made site, which just tells me he didn't even look up Gunung Padang. He did not, he didn't even read the whole Wikipedia page. He just read the part that says Grand Hancock is wrong. <laughs> like, because the Wikipedia page also says that they knew it was a man-made structure immediately. Alex Griffin, what are you doing? The very first man to study Gunung Padang believed it was a man-made structure. You did not look into this. Why are you writing this article? And of course, Griffin immediately jumps over the entire section with Dr. Ali Akbar so that he can criticize the geologist who, by the way, has a PhD. He is a geologist. He's a working expert in his field. He goes to criticize that guy, and you know why he does it? It's because Dr. Ali Akbar is an archaeologist, and a legitimate one, and he can't criticize him. So instead, he does what Wikipedia did and criticizes Nawajaja. Now, here's the thing about Akbar. He's, like I said, not mentioned on the Wikipedia page at all, so I'm not even sure that Alex Griffin thought to look into Akbar. I really think Alex Griffin just went and read the Wikipedia article on the site and came up with his own reasons why Graham was wrong without fact-checking at all. And on top of that, he does something kind of weird because he attacks not what was in the show, but what's on Wikipedia. All Nawajaja and Hancock say is that there's a little bit of evidence that this site might be much older than we thought it was, 11,600 years to maybe even as far back as 24,000. And all they said is that this is evidence worth exploring. They didn't say this proves that there was a site down there, whereas Griffin suggests that they did say it proves there's a site down there. And then Griffin completely misrepresents what was said about the chambers that they believe may be under Gunung Padang. Griffin acts as though they only used ground-penetrating radar, not talking about the two different tomography tests they used, 
and then goes on to say that without proper excavation, no conclusions can be drawn, when of course Hancock's and Nawajaja's argument was that they need proper excavation done. So Griffin is saying, because we haven't done what they suggested we do, they can't possibly be right, which is just so nonsensical that it drives me insane. My brother in Christ, he's asking you to excavate so we can know for sure. So Griffin then uses all of these lies about ancient apocalypse to claim that Graham Hancock is deliberately misleading people, those who are prone to alt-truths. There's a whole bunch of political, like, you know, dog whistling going on here, by the way, that's quite obvious. But he claims that this is a deliberate attempt to mislead people through lies and half-truths, which ironically is exactly what Alex Griffin did in this article, mislead people with lies and half-truths. And all of this to argue that because Hancock is appealing to people who are already prone to conspiracy theories, that he's somehow dangerous, even though nothing Hancock has suggested would have any effect on a single person living today. So what is dangerous is lazy, arrogant people like Alex Griffin telling us that questioning what the academics are saying is somehow dangerous even when, as I said, it would have no consequences for anybody living in the world today. All it would do if Graham Hancock was right would have us be go, wow, that's really interesting. That's a whole bunch of stuff we can study. That's pretty cool. To be clear, I'm not trying to disrespect the archaeological community. I'm not trying to say that archaeologists are bad people or bad scholars or bad scientists. What I'm trying to say is that the bad archaeologists are making the whole community really easy to attack because they keep doing this. Rather than confronting what Hancock is saying, as I just did, they're just saying Hancock's a dangerous racist. No, if Hancock is wrong about things, as he sometimes is, just explain why he's wrong. Do not go on some diatribe about him being some sort of dangerous psychopath because he thinks Atlantis might have been real. It is ridiculous. Get your act together. When it comes to research, when it comes to exploring the past, questioning the paradigm is what research is about. That is what science is. It is taking the universe, asking questions, and exploring the answers. That said, if you like what we're doing here at The Lore Lodge, you can subscribe to us on Patreon for just $1 a month. You can catch this content in a live discussion format with a Q&A every Sunday at 7 p.m. You can also support us by buying our coffee, Mount Pocono Perk from Tableau Roasting Company. That link is in the description. I'd also like to thank Aura for sponsoring this video. That was very cool of them. We appreciate you. And we also have an Amazon store that you can check out where you can get some of our recommended stuff, things that we like, things that we use, books we've read, movies we've enjoyed. And if you want to rep the Lore Lodge while also looking fantastic and feeling very comfortable, you can check out our merch at thelorelodge.shop. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and everywhere else at the Lore Lodge or at Lore Lodge. We also have two other channels, which will be getting a bunch more content this summer, those being The Weird Bible and The History Hut. Be sure to check those out. They will also both come with their own podcasts. In fact, The Weird Bible is, I think, on episode 12 as, as it comes out next week. With all that said, I'm Aiden Mattis, and thanks for stopping by The Lore Lodge.